Imagine spending $500 million just to reduce the Lord of the Rings to They took our jobs! They took our jobs! Der, der, der. I give you the Rings of Power. This show continues to be hit or miss, but this time it got close to being a decent episode. Real close. I mean, they touched it, and I guess realized you shouldn't touch what you can't grab, and so just let it go. This happens in the first 10 minutes of the show. The episode begins with Queen Bee welcoming in newborn babies. These look like common women, but they could be nobility. Everybody's dressed the same, so it's hard to tell. There's no context given for this ritual, it's just there. As Queen Bee hears the names of the babies, there's a small rumble. She writes it off as the island needing to stretch, but then the rumble happens again, and it's sustained. And then she sees the cause, a great wave that destroys Numenor. The wave crashes upon her with the full weight of the cringe of this show, and then she wakes up, and we get our first cinematic shot. This looks good, and I wish more of the show was filmed like this. It's dramatic. Sure, there's nothing on the screen that reads as Tolkien's world. It could come from any fantasy show. The point is that it's visually interesting. It's got some dynamics and texture to it, instead of looking like they filmed it on an overcast day in even light. It also appears someone learned how to edit, because the pacing of the scene was perfect. But as we know, all things must pass. So it was nice for the two minutes that it lasted, because then the show goes balls to the wall cringe. Aryan walks up on one of the blacksmith guild members that Discount Aragorn beat up, and he's given a little speech about Queen Bee taking orders from Strong Woman. It then cuts to Farazan and his Roman son in some market, where he gives his son middling advice about politics before asking why the boy is there. The son tells him about the blacksmith, and then it cuts back to Aori and listening to this man, and I'm not even going to describe what he says. I'm just going to play the audio so you know I'm not lying. This is from the show, from an episode written by the showrunners, 100% real. Elf ships on our shore. Elf workers taking your trades. Workers who don't sleep, don't tire, don't age. In a recent Irish Times article, showrunners claimed that they were inspired by Tolkien's imagination. Now, I don't claim to be a Tolkien expert. However, I have read much of his work, and I seem to have missed the part about the elves taking men's jobs. Where would you even get that from? Seriously, name the place where you got that from, because I want to read it for myself. They took our jobs. For those who like the show, does this sound good to you? I'm asking honestly, does this sound like good writing to you? This scene is supposed to explain why the Numenorians hate the elves, and apparently it's because they think the elves want to take their jobs. That sounds plausible to you. Obviously, none of this is in the books, because Professor Tolkien had a functioning brain and wouldn't write something this laughably retarded. The real reason the Numenorians hate the elves is because the Eldar are immortal. The gift of longer life turned out to backfire for men. Instead of making them grateful for more years, it made them bitter that they couldn't live longer. Sauron then plays on this with later kings, eventually turning most Numenorians against the Eldar and the Valar. He even tells Farazan that men can become immortal, but the Valar are denying this for men, which causes Farazan to go to the Undying Lands to try to take it. This reasoning, jealousy, makes more sense than the Ticker Jibs, especially since the elves are literally better craftsmen than men. Only the dwarves exceed them, and even then, only in certain situations. It makes even less sense when looking at the lore, because canonically, the Eldar, especially the Teleri, freely gave gifts to Numenor, including several Palantiri, the Seeing Stones. They never asked for anything in return, and never attempted to outdo Numenor's artisans. If anything, the elves would be impressed by what the Numenorians could achieve, which is shown throughout the Lord of the Rings in the praise the elves give to the Numenorians and their Middle-earth kingdoms of Arnor and Gondor. You can't claim to have been inspired by Tolkien's imagination, and then fundamentally alter his story. That's not inspiration, that's sheer fucking hubris. Like having the blacksmith say this, I say the queen's either blind or an elf lover, just like her father. Again, for those who like this show, this is good writing to you. Cause if it is, I question your taste. Anyway, Farazan shows up and gives some half-assed speech about keeping out the elves that wins everyone over, and is so on the edge of campy that I kept thinking, is he doing a Jack Black impression? Like he was copying Jack Black's performance in King Kong. My favorite part, though, was when the crowd chants his name, but it's so half-assed that it's not in time, and at least a third of the people are shouting something else. You'd think the showrunners would fix that in post, but it's possible that that's where they added it in. Meanwhile, Farazan's son, Kemen, flirts with Aryan. Based on this shot, does this look like Middle-earth? 
or a History Channel docudrama about ancient Rome. This is supposed to be a fantasy culture. It's inspired by real cultures, but the costuming shouldn't be so on the nose that you can't tell it apart from the real thing. Then we get another insufferable twat scene with Strong Woman being a douche to Queen Bee. Strong Woman presents her findings about Sauron and Discount Aragorn to Queen Bee, and then asks that Queen Bee sends her army to the Southlands to aid Strong Woman in bringing down the enemy. When Queen Bee, rather diplomatically, implies that she agrees with Strong Woman, but says that the politics of Numenor make sending an army impossible, Strong Woman decides to question the woman's right to power. She says she'll ask the person with the real power, the deposed king, and when Queen Bee checks her for crossing the line, Strong Woman says, There is a tempest in me that swept me to this island for a reason, and it will not be quelled by you, Regent, which gets her dumbass locked up for sedition. I've noticed something about the writing in the show, and it's that they keep making these callbacks to Peter Jackson's films. This scene was inspired by Gandalf challenging Denethor and the wonderful line, Authority was not given to you to deny the return of the king, steward. That scene works because Denethor is actually trying to act as if he's king and actively trying to prevent Aragorn from taking the throne. In the Rings of Power, Queen Bee was appointed after her father was removed. She's not trying to take power from anyone. Instead, it's given to her by the people. That makes Strong Woman's rebuke stupid on so many levels, which begs the question why it was written into the show. This scene would have made more sense if the showrunners had stuck to the lore and had Farazhan take the throne from Miriel. Then when Strong Woman challenged his authority, she'd have a point that he wasn't the true ruler. That might have been the reason Tolkien wrote the lore that way in the first place. It's almost like he knew what he was doing. Then we get another baffling scene, this time with Sildur. Because the western part of Numenor is calling him, it's literally the island calling him, Isildur decides to quit being a sailor. However, instead of just resigning like a normal person, he lets go of the rope he's holding, putting others in danger. The captain slash drill sergeant goes to blame Isildur's friends, but Isildur admits that he let the rope slip. But the captain sees through it and says Isildur did it on purpose, and so boots him out, and then, for no apparent reason, also boots out Isildur's friends. My best guess for the logic behind Isildur's actions is that in the previous episode, the captain booted off who I think was his own son for letting the rope slip. But Isildur could have just as easily verbally quit, and it would serve the same purpose. Maybe the idea was to have some conflict between Isildur and his friends, who we don't even know, but why? The most obvious conflict is with his father, Elendil. You don't need both, but they do it anyway. One of his friends gets pissy with Isildur ruining his life, because apparently the guy always wanted to be on that ship. He then makes a dig about Isildur's dead mother, and now they're no longer friends. If we knew any of these characters better, or really at all, maybe this would have some weight, but right now, it's just pointless drama. Then it cuts to Arondir in the reveal of Adar. Adar turns out to be a corrupted elf, and the orcs seem to look at him the way a child would their parent. Adar goes to a dying orc and cries in the parent's sympathy as he takes the orc out of his misery by stabbing him to death. The other orcs then come in and carefully take away the dead orc's body. All of this was created for the show. The orcs are nothing like this in any of Tolkien's writings. However, I will give the showrunner some leeway here because Tolkien did say in one of his letters that the orcs aren't altogether evil. They are capable of good and could be redeemed, it'd just be really hard to do. In theory, they could have some ritual like this or feel sympathy or pity for each other. There's just nothing in the books that supports this scene. At any rate, Adar asks where Arondir is from, and he answers Beleriand, which makes no sense because in the prologue, Strong Woman implied that there were no elves in Middle-earth. It also contradicts another scene where Arondir spoke to the old elf about what he did in the old lands, which came across as if Arondir was from Valinor. This is what happens when you're not clear in your world building. Adar then hints to Arondir that he used to be an elf, and also says that he has no gods, at least not yet, implying that he may see Sauron as his god, which could be an indication of the effects of the corruption. He tells Arondir to give a message to the men hiding in the Elven Tower. Speaking of the Watchtower, turns out that all the villages of the Southlands have poured into the tower, including those near Orodruin. That's Mount Doom, meaning these people are coming from the west side of the Mordor mountain range. It's surprising there would still be so many people considering that in the lore, Shelah fed on the men in the area until they fled. Turns out having all these people has resulted in a food shortage. For some reason, Bronwyn is in charge. Apparently there's no town mayor, sheriff, or authority figure of any sort. Nope, she's in charge because, and this is from the show, it was her idea to come to the tower. It would be easier to say it's because she's got the vagina, because that's the actual reason she's in charge. And like every other strong woman in charge, she has terrible people skills. She says everyone will need to cut their rations, and the tavern owner slash farmer says no, and they have this argument over food. Her son, Theo, who isn't even the same race as her, 
chimes in and says that they can get proof from the towns they abandoned instead of trying to hunt for rabbits since the meat wouldn't last a day. Which begs the question why it didn't occur to any of them to bring food since they knew the watchtower had been abandoned. One of the guys says that no one would want to risk going back into town, but Theo says he'll do it, which makes his mom chew him out. But he's a teenager, so obviously he's going to do it. He takes his friend, the boy who challenged the Ron during the first episode, and turns out to be a total pussy. Surprise. As they make their way into the village, the boys see mutilated bodies of farm animals. Theo also brought along the broken sword he stole from the farmer. They gather a bunch of food, but Theo wants to check the tavern. His friend ain't having it, so Theo goes in by himself, while inside, the door suddenly closes. Meanwhile, outside, clouds cover the sun, meaning now the orcs can come out, so the kid's friend ditches him. Back in the tavern, it turns out there's an orc inside, and he attacks Theo, cutting the kid's leg. The boy then draws the hilt, stabs himself with it, causing the blade to form, and uses it to cut the orc. This is another thing made for the show. No such weapon exists in the book as far as I know. Theo flees outside and the orc shouts that he's found what the orcs are looking for. Excuse me? What are you talking about? I actually have to check all the orc scenes to see if I missed this, and the only reference I could find was this comment in the trenches when one of the elves says that the orcs are looking for something and Arondir says maybe it's a weapon. Now, it turns out that this hilt is a much more important thing than we thought, but we only get this passing reference to it. We have no idea why it's important, and really no idea what it is. You can see why this is here, though. The Lord of the Rings had a broken blade, so this show will have one too. But instead of setting it up so we understand the danger of what Theo's using, it's just there. We're supposed to get it after the fact, but the scenes hinge on the tension of the boy playing with these dark arts. We need to know why he shouldn't be doing this, and that information needs to be in the show, not rely on the audience's knowledge of the films or the books. Anyway, Theo hides in a well and almost gets spotted by the orc when he drinks from a bucket and tosses it down and it hits the boy on the head and he groans. Theo hides underwater, which is smart, but then bursts out of the water when the orc leaves, which is not smart because the orc would hear this. Then it cuts to Celebrimbor reminiscing about Elendil, Elrond's father, and it's got that dramatic lighting I like that's highlighting every wrinkle on this dude's face. Seriously, he looks like a hobbit. Nothing about this says immortal ever young elf. Everything about this says in two months I get my AARP card. At any rate, Celebrimbor tells Elrond that he thinks Doran is hiding something from him, so Elrond goes to visit his friend who's not at home. Queen Doritos makes excuses, claiming that Durin's gone to some deep, far-off mine, but Elrond notices that all of Durin's gear is on the wall. It's literally the only other thing in this ridiculously empty house. While this is happening, Queen Doritos yells at her still-unseen kids about hitting each other and singing some rhyme. Elrond accuses Queen Doritos of deception, and she says, Calling the dwarf dishonest in her own home? That's a recipe for strong gravy. Stop. For the love of God, stop. These in-universe idioms are a common fantasy trope, and they rarely work. They sound silly because idioms are based on culture, but the audience knows nothing about this fictional culture, so it's not clear why these people would say these things. For example, are the dwarves known for being obsessed with gravy? Do they like it unusually thick, hearty, and strong? Is it a thing they built their culture around? If it's not, then it sounds contrived. There is a way around this. Introduce the culture, hammer in the aspects of the culture that are important to those people, and then use the idiom. Anywho, Queen Doritos gets pissy for being called out, and tells a bigger lie that Elrond sees right through but just lets lie. Instead, he follows her when she meets with Durin, and sees their conversation from afar well enough that he can read Durin's lips. So Elrond can read a dwarf's beard-covered lips from hundreds of feet away, but the elves couldn't see acres of missing forest. I give you the rings of power. Elrond figures out where Durin's been going, knows his footprints coming away from the wall, and tries to open the door. But as we all know, dwarf doors are hidden, sometimes so well that even their makers can't find them. But Elrond remembers the kid's rhyme and pounds on the door to its rhythm, which opens the door. He finds out what it is Durin was hiding. Mithril. They've discovered a mithril load in the mountain. Then Durin pops up from one of the mine shafts and claims that he knew this was the real reason why Elrond was there. Of course, that doesn't make a lick of sense because no one's mentioned the find in the previous episodes. So how would Elrond, Celebrimbor, or Gil-Galit even know it was there? It seems like the showrunners are trying to add in a bit of lore, which is that some of the elves settled in the Region because they heard about the Mithril. But to add this in, we actually have to see the elves learning about the Mithril. Without seeing that, the accusation makes no sense. Just like Durin forcing Elrond to swear not to tell anyone about it. Why is he asking this? In context to the show, what reason would Elrond have to share this information when Durin just told him that mining the ore is dangerous and deadly? 
Nothing about Elrond's character suggests he would talk about it in general, let alone after he knows mining it could kill people. It's just there for arbitrary tension. However, Elrond makes the promise, and then Doran lets him keep the ore sample as a sign of their friendship. Right after this happens, there's a rumble and the mine collapses, trapping several dwarves in the shaft. Doran and Elrond race to help. Now, just a quick thing. In my previous video, I talked about this glowing thing in the box Doran and his father opened. That appears to be Mithril that they were looking at, and I never suspected that because Mithril doesn't glow. It looks like silver that never loses its luster, but it doesn't glow. So that wasn't me getting my lore wrong. It was the showrunners, I don't know, copying Pulp Fiction. Moving on, Kim and Max on AR in again, which really adds nothing to the show because neither of them have done a damn thing to move the plot along. But finally, we get a solid scene out of the show, but probably not for the reasons the showrunners intended. See, Discount Aragorn puts Strong Woman in her place. He asks how she wound up in jail, comparing her to a cult running at full gallop. He asks if it ever occurred to her that she's not dealing with trolls and orcs, but men. Strong Woman gets pissy, as expected, about being lectured about the art of war, and Discount Aragorn reminds her that talking to men isn't a war. So she listens as he checks her on her attitude. As he lays it out, she insulted the queen and her people, rebuffed the queen's kindness, and demanded a ship. And now she's in jail. Why? It wasn't because of some suggestion about helping the people of the Southlands. It was demanding to see the king who no one's seen in years. It finally dawns on Strong Woman that there must be a reason why no one's seen him. Keep in mind, this woman is 2,000 years old, and this man, who is a hundredth of her age, schools her on how to think. First, thank you. I'm glad someone said it in the show. Second, fuck you for writing her like this in the first place. You didn't have to make Galadriel an insufferable twat. Not at all. That was a conscious decision that narratively doesn't work because the character is so unlikable that you're not rooting for her, but instead waiting for someone to put her in her place. That is terrible writing. And unfortunately, it continues. Farzan comes in and says that Queen Bee is going to have Strong Woman escorted off the island. Instead of just going, which is apparently what Strong Woman wanted, she beats up all the guards and locks them in her cell. Discount Aragorn stops Farazan from attacking her by saying there's no point if he knows where she's going. Then it cuts to Aarian in Sildor, where the sister realizes her brother got dismissed from the ship. The scene is supposed to be a meaningful family scene, but it doesn't move the plot at all. It's one of the many glaring problems in the show. It seems like two or three different shows mushed together. There's the elven story, the hobbit story, and the men's story, and they don't connect in any tangible way. And I'm sure there will be people foaming with apologia to defend this, but we're halfway through the season. This is where you need to start putting these pieces together. You can't have scenes that are so removed from the general narrative that you could edit them out and nothing would be lost. The only relevant thing that happens in this scene is that we hear that Strong Woman escaped, but we already knew that, so whatever. Now, where does Strong Woman escape to? Well, the tower. She assassin creeds her ass up the white pole instead of going through the door at the bottom. She finds something to break a window and goes up to the king's chamber where Queen Bee awaits with the bedridden king. Strong Woman is shocked that Queen Bee knew she would come there, and Queen Bee tells her that there are guards waiting below to escort Strong Woman off the island. Wouldn't Strong Woman have seen them when she climbed into the tower? That would be the reason why she climbed the tower instead of using the front door like a normal person. But if she didn't know this, why didn't she try the front door? Better yet, since we already saw her destroy guards before, could she just beat up these ones and go in? Did no one read the script to fix this obvious contradiction? Just a single shot of the guards at the door and strong woman climbing could have worked. But no, that makes too much sense and this isn't that kind of show. At any rate, strong woman apologizes for being a douche and Queen Bee says something about strong woman knowing the full extent of the king's condition and keeping it to herself. Is he not old and dying? Has something else happened to him? If so, what? Because the audience doesn't know. You can't just throw that in there as if we know when you haven't told us. But whatever. Strong Woman asks, politely this time, why Queen Bee isn't one of the faithful when her father was. So Queen Bee explains. Originally, her father was quiet about his support of the elves in the Valar. But when he became king, he said everyone needed to repent. And this cost him his throne. She was made regent in his place. And oh look, there's Narsil. No, nope, you're well past getting any credit for that. Then Queen Bee shows Strong Woman what looks like a broken palantir. Apparently her father showed it to her once she became regent. She says that of the seven stones, the other six are lost. And that's a massive change from the lore, because the seven are saved by Elendil and brought with him to Middle-earth when he and his sons Isildur and Anarion set up the kingdoms of Arnor and Gondor. 
The stones are lost during the Third Age, not the Second, and at least two of them, the Orthanc Stone in Isengard and the Honor Stone in Minas Tirith, remain where they were placed, so the showrunners just broke something they didn't need to break. The theory behind the show is that it could connect with the Lord of the Rings, either the book or the film. Well, now it can't because you fundamentally altered the story. Now you have to explain how the stones wind up in Middle-earth, let alone the kingdoms of Arnor and Gondor, only to be lost again over the centuries. If you cut out that one line, you'd have been fine. Anyway, Queen Bee warns Strong Woman about touching it, as it's different from the other Palantir, but that turns out not to be entirely true. The Palantir shows Strong Woman a vision of the destruction of Numenor, which would be the future, and all Palantiri can do this. It's dependent on the will of the user whether it works, or whether someone else with the matching communicating stone has a strong enough will to shift its gaze and make the other user see what they want them to see, which is partly what Sauron did to Saruman and tried to do with Denethor in The Lord of the Rings. So it could be that this Palantir is unusually set to only show the fate of Numenor, or someone with its mate stone is causing this to be the only thing that can be seen. It's not clear which is happening, because not explaining things is a feature of the show. Queen Bee then tells Strong Woman that her arrival to the island is what starts this vision, and so Queen Bee has taken her arrival as a sign that Numenor's fate is sealed. She doesn't blame Strong Woman, but she doesn't think anything can be done. Strong Woman again tries to convince her to help the Southlands, but Queen Bee replies that while she personally wants to, the rest of Numenor doesn't, so she refuses. Back with Bronwyn, the hunt for food turned up next to nothing because all the animals had fled. The pussy returns without Theo and lies about ditching him. Back in the village, it's nightfall now and apparently Theo has hidden in the well this entire time and no orc has bothered to check it again or get a drink of water or anything. Instead, they've checked the rest of the village looking for him for hours and now are just starting to leave. Theo makes his way past the orcs only to be caught by the one who cut him earlier. The orc goes to cut off Theo's arm but gets a sword through the back. It's a Rondir, who's apparently been given weapons when he was released. However, it appears Adar neglected to tell the orcs that he wanted a Rondir to deliver a message to the men because they try to hunt him down and kill him. So a Rondir and Theo run through the night as they try to make it to the tower. How far away is this tower? Because the boys made it there relatively quick, but apparently it took longer to get back and now takes longer to get there because Bronwyn ran the entire night to try to rescue Theo, who she randomly finds in the middle of the forest. The trio run, with the orcs shooting arrows at them until they make it into the open grass just in time for the sun to come out and stop the orcs. Now there's nothing the orcs can do but stare and screech at these people standing just 200 yards away. If only they had something that could cross that distance, like a bow and arrow. Shadowversity can handle whether the types of bows and arrows the orcs appear to use could actually reach that distance, but that doesn't matter because in the show, when the trio flee, the orcs shoot at them, hitting the spot where they once stood. So why weren't they shooting at the trio the moment the trio entered this open plain with nowhere to hide? If orcs' arrows can reach them, the orcs should have been shooting the whole time. And even if they couldn't, the trio should have kept running, not stopped 400 feet away from the edge of the woods. Then we get the scene of Queen Dorito singing to the mountain to get it to let the dwarves trapped in the mines come out alive. Apparently, this works. The dwarves come out alive. We even see some of the gold from Queen Dorito's fingers shimmering over the rocks. Queen Doritos apologizes for lying, but Elrond lets it go. Then Durin comes in and complains about his father shutting down the mine, and Elrond shares his feelings about wanting to see his father just one last time. This is the only scene where the conversation makes sense, because Elrond explains what happened to his father. Erendil was turned into a star, so unlike Durin, he can't even talk to his father and hear his approval or disappointment. That moment works. The follow-up, where Durin goes to talk with his father, fails, because we never see him and his father argue. We had one previous scene with them where they speculated about Elrond's plans. If you want to have this fatherly love moment, you have to show the conflict that it supposedly resolves. This is basic storytelling. Moving on, the trio arrive back to the tower and Arondir reveals Aldar's message. Swear fealty to him or die. Yeah, you definitely needed the elf alive to do that. You couldn't have just sent the orcs who can speak plain common language. Meanwhile, Theo gets called out by the tavern owner for stealing the broken sword and it turns out that he's used it on himself and is loyal to Sauron. The falling meteor was a portent for Sauron's return. Essentially, he thinks the boy is on Sauron's side. Finally, the episode ends with strong woman being sent off with sad music, only for Queen Bee to change her mind and decide to free discount Aragorn and send men to fight in the Southlands. Elendil asks for volunteers. Isildur's former friends agree, and then Isildur himself, along with several people in Queen Bee's court. So much of this show has nothing to do with Tolkien's stories that I think it's best not to think of this as a Middle-earth show. 
just treat it like the generic fantasy story that it is. That solves the issue with the lore, but it doesn't solve the issue with the writing and plotting of the show. It's nice that they finally figured out how to edit, but the dialogue is still clunky, and there's so many scenes where you're missing the connective plot points for the scenes to even matter. More troubling is that this show is basically a rehash of Peter Jackson's films. Tolkien used many themes and even scenarios twice, sometimes three or four times, but you can see how he was interweaving them. He's not a writer by nature. That's a skill he developed, which is apparent in the evolution of his tales. And because he wrote and rewrote these stories over the course of decades, he added in the connective tissue in less obvious ways than, say, Stephen King does with the Dark Tower themes in his books. The showrunners can't use anything outside of the Lord of the Rings appendices, but that doesn't mean they have to crib from other adaptations, especially the way that they're doing it. You can't just lift lines, change a few words, and act like it works. It doesn't. Take the time to build a story in a rational way that doesn't contradict other works, like the Silmarillion. You can't use that stuff, but you do know what it is. You don't have to contradict it. Even then, it doesn't solve the mediocre writing. This is a showrunner's first show, and it's obvious. The pacing is off. The characters are hit or miss. There are beats in the show that have nothing to do with driving the plot. It's painfully clear that the showrunners have no idea what they're doing. They just have a story that they wrote that they want to tell that has nothing to do with J.R.R. Tolkien. They're simply using his name to get people to watch their show. Unfortunately for them, it's not working out how they want it. The ratings are under House of the Dragon and She-Hulk. The usually positive lefty critics are saying the show is boring and poorly paced. Even normies are catching that the show widely deviates from the books, which is stunning because most of them probably haven't read the books. There are four episodes left. We're at the halfway point. If you've not got it together by now, you're not going to. So we'll see how deep into Moria these fools delve. I have a feeling they're about to bump right into Doran's Bane. But what do I know? I'm just some guy.